God. Hallelujah. Take us back, Lord, right? Yes. Isn't that amazing? Well, we started a, a season. You know, I forgot to share the testimony. We may have the basketball gym for basketball in March. So, yes. uh, the ball and uh, praise God. So, we may be going back to some of the things that some of the young adults have been looking forward to doing. So that's exciting. Amen? Amen. All right, folks, we're going to start a, a series uh, and something that the Lord has been doing. Today we're going to start our, what we call, No Excuse, excuse Plan. Mm. Yeah. Turn to someone, No Excuse. No, no Excuse. excuse. Right, this is a No Excuse Plan. Okay. Are we ready for that? Mm. Amen. Yeah, that means we are, we're going to be pushing past obstacles and we're going to be full steam ahead yeah. towards the goal Jesus wants us to fulfill in our lives, Lord. When we say that we're not going to play church anymore, we're really not going to play church. You're going to be the church. Amen. Turn to someone. You're going to be the church. You're going to be, be the church. church. Wherever you go. Wherever you go. That's it. That's what it's all about. Because what, what are you going to accomplish here in the church? Unless it's to come and pray and get filled and so that you can go back out and take care of what we need to do. Amen. So whatever those goals are, whether it's health, finances, stability, prosperity, whatever it is, we're passing towards our what we call looking forward to honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So I want to start with this, because we want to have victory in our Lord and Savior, right? So I want to start with this plan by teaching you a very important principle. I won't panic, because this principle I know pretty well, and, I, and it's very effective, but it's a very important principle that I learned from the game of poker. Wow. <laughs> I only know, only know the game of poker. Card game. Okay. There are a few that know the game of poker. Well, I don't have time to let you describe the game, but you can learn a lot about life from poker. And this is a principle I want us to learn from this game. You know that usually in poker, uh, for instance, you may think that having the, the, the best hand when you get the cards, and you think that because you have the best hand, you think that you're going to win. And sometimes you think because you have the worst hand, you think you're going to lose. But that's not the case when it comes to poker. You guys understand that principle so far? Yes. Okay, because if you think that way, you'll be wrong. Often, the person with the best hand doesn't end up winning, usually. Why is that? Anyone here that knows the game of poker, why is that? The worst hand. I'm saying that sometimes the person with the best hand in their cards, in their hand, doesn't usually always win. Even though you have the hand that practically can actually win. So that's, that's not the case. And sometimes the case that when you have the worst hand, you can actually win everything. And in life, it's like that. Right? Now, honestly, anyone here know the game of how it works? No? Oh, OK. Well, anyway, do the best you can with what you got right now. And then I'll explain it afterwards. But anyway, the point is that sometimes the person with the best hand doesn't always win. Victory is given to the person who takes advantage of every opportunity. One more time, please. please. Victory okay. is given to the person who takes advantage of every opportunity. And this is what this game teaches, this principle. How do you know what you have is the winning hand? How do you know? How would you be able to tell? You have to play the hand you dealt in order to find out whether you really have the winning hand. But there's a thing called in poker where you can actually fold. And fold means you quit. You throw in your cards. You give up. And sometimes because you see your, the cards you're dealt, you think that doesn't matter. It's not good enough. But in the game of life, like in poker, you never know until you finish the game. Anything can happen. You've heard of the thing called bluff? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know? How often do you see people bluff? Now, we're, in life, we don't want to be bluffers. And bluffing in life, sometimes it's like, you know, people can actually use the word of God, they know it, and they can throw the word out there, they can try to live it, they can do this and do that, but really have no substance. It's a bluff. <laughs> you see? Now, like life, poker, you know, it's, it's, it's there. Each of us is dealt a hand when we come into the world, right? Some will take, uh, be given every advantage. Some will come out from a life that's really been blessed, 
prosperous, they have everything, good family, good, good health, good neighborhood, good everything, good school, you have all the best. And then you have those that don't have a very good hand that they're dealt. They are poor, they come from poverty, they come from all the dysfunctional families and all the things that happen. You guys can relate to that? Yes. See? And yet, although this tough, they have been dealt these tough hands in life, doesn't mean that it ends there. So most of us would predict that those born with a good, successful life, with that blessing, should, the outcome should be great and good, which is not normally a guarantee. And sometimes you think that those with a bad upbringing and all the bad circumstances, that looking at that, that they are going to end up not being successful. Now, is that true? No. no. So when you're dealt a hand, you got to play the hand you're dealt. And this is our focus right now as we look forward to having a no-excuse plan. Now, I want to make sure that we are very thorough with this because as we start this, I want to get to make it clear that there is a process that we truly have to understand to be successful. Now, we can measure success based on the world's perspective, or you can measure it based on God's perspective. And a lot of times, we're measuring it based on the world, the world because it's what we live every day. And how often do we live God's world? So he has a perspective that God says that we are in the world, but we are what? No. Not of it. No matter what the circumstances you have been born into, having a lot or having a little will not determine your happiness. While it is true that many people would often use hard circumstances as a crutch, and in this last several weeks, and I'm going to tell you new clients that I've got coming in, I have seen some incredibly dysfunctional things happening. People have lived their lives based on their circumstances and are totally crippled. They have accepted the fact, being Christians in a church has accepted the fact that they can't do it, that they're not smart enough, good enough, qualified to overcome anything because of how they feel, but how they see things. And a lot of times it's an excuse so that they don't have to take responsibility. I want you to hold on to this because it always comes down to that. The truth is that when we don't overcome these things, it's not because we can't. It's because we choose not to. Because the Word of God tells you the victory you and I have. We are capable. He's already overcome everything. So here, we can easily use our circumstances as a crutch for why they don't succeed or why they don't have to change. They lost because their circumstances were hard, they said. They lost because they looked at the hand they were dealt and folded immediately. Mm -hmm. But there's a reason God allows us to go through certain journeys. And this is what we're going to look to see in how God works in, in today's life today. They give up without playing the game. And we're going to focus on the first truth. Tell me, the first truth. Say, the first truth. The first the truth. truth. The hand you were dealt cannot be changed. It's the circumstance. But the way you play it can. Turn to someone and say that. I want you to repeat it. Word for word. The hand you were dealt cannot be changed. But the way you play it can. All right? We're going to change no matter what happened. You're an example of people who were dealt a hand, but they didn't fold. There are many people in the Bible that have dealt with circumstances in life that were horrible, horrific, a matter of fact. But here, before we go any further, I want to read a story in the Bible. I want you to, if you have your Bibles, please turn to it and ask the book of Acts chapter 12. Because I want you to first understand the power that God has given us. God working power. This is God's working power. And here's a story in chapter, in the, in the book of Acts chapter 12, I'm going to read from the verse 1, and it's a little, little something to read here, it's a substance enough, but I want you to listen to the story and tell me what you think. It was about this time that King Herod 
arrested some who belong to the church, intending to persecute them. Verse 2, he had James, the brother of John, one of the disciples, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the feast of the unleavened bread. After the, he arresting him, after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to the guarded, to be guarded by the four squads of four soldiers each, which is a total of sixteen soldiers to guard this one person. You believe that? 16 soldiers got one person. Intended to bring him, because this is what Herod's intention was to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Now the Passover lasts 12, about a week, the celebration. But he was served for me and waiting for this moment so that he could just publicly bring this out after the festival before the Jews and the people. So Peter, verse 5, was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for God for him, or praying to God for him. Verse 6, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, that's a week later, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries, which are soldiers who stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, a light shone in the cell, he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off of Peter. Now imagine, Peter's chained there with guards. He's chained actually to soldiers. Chains, neck, hands, feet, he's chained. And here they fell off when the angels told him, get up. Here goes verse 14. When she, uh, and no, I'm sorry, I'm back to verse 7. Verse 6. The night that before Herod was bringing him, he came and held the chain. Verse 8. Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and your sandals, which means he was stripped, right? And Peter did so. He wrapped your cloak, or he said, Wrap your cloak around you and, and follow me. And the angel told him, Peter followed the angel. And he says that in verse 9. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing. See? He didn't know what the angel was doing. Was, was it really happening? He was saying to himself. He thought he was seeing a vision. Peter was saying to himself. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gates leading, leading to the city. It opened for them. And then the gates says it. It opened for them by itself. And they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel had left them. Think of the situations because this simplifies a lot of the bondage and prison stuff that we go through in life. A lot of the junk that we carry sort of, you can actually apply to this principle. And believe me folks, we got a lot of junk. And here, Peter, all of a sudden realizes, I'm free. So where does he go? Then verse 11. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the law sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this had, had uh, dawned on him, he went to his house of, the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and where they were praying. So they were actually praying in, during this time that he's in prison. Right? So they're praying for him. Peter knocks at the door at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to and answered the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so ex excited, so overjoyed, that she ran back without opening it, opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept knocking and when they opened the door, they saw him there. They saw him, and they were astonished. What did you just hear? Well, don't you know that there are people 
Have you better put it this way? Do you know people who have been held captive in their prison of their own making? We sort of understand that right here, God's letting us know that, the, first of all, that the power of corporate prayer. Of what can happen when we actually stand and trust and believe what God can do in prayer. And I have seen some amazing things. You know, God wants to do as us as being a witness to the world around us. Because they're pretty much blind. They're just rolling the dice. We don't need to roll the dice. We need to be confident in what God is doing in us. So we're going to deal with the hand that God's dealt us. So here is one thing I want you to realize. There have been many people who have been dealt hands like being crippled, blind, and all kinds of stuff. And almost like in the story of Mark chapter 2, where the, you know, the paralegic, the, the friends bring him to, to Jesus, they open the curtains out, the roof of the door, they break down the roof to cut him in to bring him down, so just can you know, there are people who got stuff and, and friends who say, listen, you can be free. God does some amazing things. So, so moving forward, no excuse plan. We're going to stop folding our cards. We're going to Give, giving up in defeat at the obstacles that challenge us. We're going to stop more mourning and moaning about the hands we have been dealt. So you can turn to someone and say, we're going to stop that. We're going to all change in some areas that have defeated us. But we're not going to walk away from these obstacles. Now, what do you consider obstacles, folks? Let me hear. What do you consider obstacles? I'm not going to guess. I'm not going to try to read your mind. I want to hear. What would you say are obstacles? Be realistic. Laziness. Laziness, okay. I guess you don't have any obstacles, Unnecessary right? Unnecessary paperwork. Unnecessary paperwork, all right? Yes? Mind being certain individual. Repeat that again? Mind being certain individual. Okay. Not enough money. Not enough money. Excuses. Excuses. What obstacles? If you don't have any obstacles, it's really? Of, it's too cold to go to church today. It's too cold to go to church. I love it. Uh, as practical as you're going to get. Um, getting up at 5.30 in the morning. Getting up so early in the morning. I'm not qualified. I'm not good I'm enough. I'm not qualified or good enough. enough. Now we're talking. Is that it? Exercising every day. Yeah. <laughs> the test is too hard. I'm not even going to bother. That's me. right. I want you to relate to what we're talking about, folks. You see? We have to relate. Remember, winning at life has less to do with your hand and more to do with how you play it. So we're going to play our hand, the God, the God, the hand that God has given us. It's not the person with the best hand that always wins. Remember this. That's why poker is so exciting. A great poker player can defy the hand he's dealt if he's confident enough. But let's get to some of the truths here, all right? Because uh, can other players you know, you can find that you will have a delta hands and your life is probably far better than one that looks that good. Your hand can be far better than one that looks really great. So it may look beautiful out there. You know how you say a saying that's green on the other side? It may look green on the other side, that's all. Doesn't mean it's better, right? It's about your attitude, your mindset, your faith in getting the goal. So here it is. We're going to focus on some principles. And the principles that I want you to focus on is the goal that we have. Because as we, as children of light, we're going to confront a lot of things, and this is what God is doing in us. And i got some stories to tell you of how God has done some amazing things, especially with me this past week and when I was away. I, I've gone through some things that you wouldn't believe. And I want to share these things in, in, in this context in a minute. Think about the obstacles that has always stood in the way of your goals. Think of the obstacles, 
after those that have stood in the way of your goals. How many of you have goals? Okay, has there been anything that's been hindering them? Yes. Okay, to keep this in mind. You don't have to share if you don't want to. I know that it causes you to have trials and hardships. Since you, can, you can't change your cars, how are you going to play them at this point? Are you going to continue to fold? Are you going to accept them and still move forward towards your goal? Or will you blame your cards for the limitations in your life? Will you blame the cards you were dealt for the limitations in your life? And how often do we do that? Too often. Too often. See, that's because we're limited in the way we see things. God wants us to go beyond this thing. So often people, uh, they do, they, they just take whatever it is that they have just not to be responsible. Here's the testimony of someone who was born with a great disadvantage. There are many who do that. Paul had an advantage. The Apostle Paul teaches this. He says he was, he was a Pharisee, by the way. He was a scholar of scholars. He was, he had, he was favored. He was probably rich growing up. I mean, he had everything going for himself. And what was he going doing? He was out persecuting the Jews. He was out there because he thought he was pleasing God. Unfortunately, he himself says this in, in Philippians. He says it, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. He tells us what he felt. He said, I was circumcised when I was 8 years old. I, 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 I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel. I am a member of the Benjamin a tribe. And he said, I'm a real Hebrew. Uh, he says, if there ever was one, I am the one, a Pharisee, who demanded strict obedience through Jewish law. He says, I was so zealous that I harshly, pers harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. So often we can say all the right things, do all the things we're doing, all the things for God and church and all that, and then it doesn't mean squat. And that's what Paul said. Didn't mean anything. Because he was playing church. In his time, he was in a denial. And sometimes it's easy to play church because you don't have to be responsible. So give me an idea. What does it mean to play church? What is your idea of playing church? I know you don't want to I think, think right like now. Maybe but. just come to church on Sunday and then that's it. You don't know, read the Bible, you don't know, follow the law, you know, don't okay. follow God's rules. You just live any way you want to. Good. Okay. On the job, I have a lot of people around me with uh, not so clean mouths. That's right. And they like to share stories and stuff. And um, I can be the song one person or. Think about this a minute. I want you to write this down. Make a list. What do you think is playing church? What does, what does that mean? Because if you're playing church, and you need to know the difference between what it is to be the church and what it is to play. So as you write this down, as you give this some focus, Paul is telling us in verse 7, he said, I once thought that these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes. Everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ, Jesus as Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ. Paul had been born with a great hand, but it didn't give him happiness because it didn't make him right with God. He learned that only a relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will make him right with his goal was no longer to be righteous in the eyes of man, but righteous in the eyes of God. That is being the church. And we're going to be challenging those areas because we're always looking to please man. James 1.7 tells us, there's no reason why one of God's chosen people, believers, has to yield to temptation. He says, not one of his God's people have an excuse to yield to temptation. He must learn to resist it or resist its daily force or he can never grow into a spiritual, mature relationship with God. 
We have to learn to endure and persevere the temptations we face in order to grow and be mature. There are a lot of challenges that we're going to face. They're going to come and go, and there are many things that God uses to keep us developing. Sometimes we don't see it because we don't understand it. We want to be to know how Christ experienced the mighty power that raised him from the dead. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to understand this principle. We're going to really get to a place. And the way we're going to start doing that is by, number one, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. We need to stop looking to the past. Now, what does that mean to you? Just want to get, get clear direction as to we understand. What does it mean? Stop looking at the past. How can the past hinder you? Yes. Forgive yourself. What else? So how can I look back on the stuff I had in West Chester before I went back to the Bronx? And it doesn't allow me to appreciate what I have. So I'm too busy looking back at what I used to have. That's right. How many folks have who have left living word and say, I can't find, they don't even go to church now because I can't find the church that I used to have. Mm -hmm. Because I don't enjoy that. Because I don't get that anymore. Mm -hmm. It's all excuses. Just because they don't want to what? Say it. Be responsible. It all comes down to that. You don't want to be responsible. I press on to reach, this is what Paul says, I press on to reach the end of the race to receive that heavenly prize. God has a prize for us today. Turn to someone and say, God has a prize for you. He's calling us to live a life of victory. Turn to him, tell him. He wants you to live a life of what? Victory. How do you describe that? How will you describe to me what's a, a, a life of victory? Running a good race. Okay. Big, but good. Things may not always go the way I want them to, but I have peace. Okay. Freedom. Freedom. I love that one. Just, what? Just knowing and expecting that God is going to give you good things. That's right. Knowing that you're secure. Now here's what, yes? And there's a scripture that comes to me that God, that God works all things. All things. He works all things. A full life is a witness to the goodness and favor of God. Turn to someone. A full life is a witness to the goodness and favor of God. It's time we start a being a better what? Witness. That is fruit. Based on the, the word of God. True or not true? True. A full life is a witness. That's what it says. And here's some truths I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you four truths right now we're going to talk about. Right now. You ready for these? No excuse plan. Turn to someone and say, make sure you know this is a no excuse plan. No excuse plan. When we walk down this road, this is about growth, folks. Being a witness. Not here, when we stand gathered together, is when we go out these doors that you need to be a witness. When you get to a place where you can come here and share the testimonies of what God is doing you in your life out there, then you're grown. But if you just come, just to serve and uh, you know, anyone can do that. I can go to a soup kitchen and, and just go there for hours. Hand out a plate. Jesus love you. <laughs> Wonderful. Hey, you do a good night. Good morning. That's great. Where's the fruit? What do you know about the person you just fed? What have you said to him to make his life better? Is that fruit? It's not fruit. Now here's because God is really putting this sting in there to burn. A life is not, and this is one of the, the no excuse plans uh, truths. Life is not our problem. Our problem is that we fall, we fail to take responsibility for our lives. 
Now, we can say, how do we not take responsibility for our life? I work, I feed my kids, I do this, I do that. I do the basics, the essentials, the things that I need. Now, here's, I'm going to give you an example of what this is like. You remember that story I gave you several weeks ago how in McDonald's, the guy sued McDonald's because he spilled the coffee and it was too hot? But there were two girls who, who sued McDonald's, right? The lawsuit claimed that McDonald's hamburgers and fries were addictive. Yeah, yeah. Thereby causing them to be overweight. They felt that eating, these, their eating habits were out of control and it was McDonald's fault. Life continued to be bad for these girls because the, ju the judge uh, ruled against them. The judge said, if the consumers know eating McDonald's food will cause weight, weight gain and ill health, and they continue, continue to satisfy their appetites with McDonald's, they can't blame McDonald's. And so often we continue to live the life we shouldn't do, do the things we know we shouldn't do, and we want to blame somebody else because we don't want to be responsible. But God's promise is you, you have victory, folks. See, the girls play the blame game. While their suit was uh, maybe silly, they did, they did want... Uh, and they did what many of us do. They what? They blame others for where we are and why we are stuck. The world's a hard place, folks, and full of temptations. But we have to be be a free. We have to we have to be free with what God has given us. We have to understand what this means. There are a lot of junk out there. Are we ready for moving forward? Ready for you know, all the prepared not to eat the, the products that are out there, that cheap stuff, tempting stuff, that stuff that's convenient, the stuff that comes easy for us. But you know, if we do those things, you know, they're not gonna produce nothing good. We're gonna start blaming others for why you're not successful. So we're gonna do the excuse, no excuse diet. We're going to have it to take responsibility for the choices we make. Galatians 2.20 tells us what? Galatians 2.20. I myself no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So I live my life in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You guys heard that? Sometimes we get so frustrated trying to put so our selfish nations to death. And you know what? Trying to deal with the junk that hinders us. Like it's like trying to put our, our selfish nations to death. It's like pouring gasoline on fire to turn it off. It's hard. It's not easy. Because we can't do it in our own strength. And we try. We try. James 1, 6, 7 tells us, but when we ask, he must, we must believe. And not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blowing here and there, and we constantly broken, always playing games and, and never really believe because we struggle with our own stuff. Number two, you need to own your life. Turn to someone and say, you need to own your life. You need to own, you your, need life. To own your life. Own your life, not your fantasy. <laughs> because that's the problem. Own your life, not your fantasy. What's the fantasy? It's not real. Not real. But it surely plays a big role in your life. How does the fantasy work in your life? Pacifies you for a little while because we get a moment out of reality. That's right. It's not real. Because now that we're dealing with some truth here, so often we live our fantasy instead of living in our reality. How do we do that? Because our fantasy is based on what we want, want to please the flesh. And God's saying, i got to clean you out. We gotta, why do you think we go through so many difficult things? God is pressing us. You know, I, it's interesting because uh, we sometimes we realize we repeat the same patterns in our life. I, I, like I was telling you earlier, I was going to share with you 
sir walks out because he met some of my family in Puerto Rico. He came to help me. We were working in Puerto Rico rigorously. We never got to the beach. We never did anything. You know, but we had a great time. We worked nonstop for the time we were there. We had a lot of repairs to do in my house over there. And I spent more time in Home Depot <laughs> than I have in five years. I went like at 12 times in, in no time, just going back and forth. Just with stuff we had the equipment I had to go get. The, the odd thing was that here, here's the thing that um, as I was I was going there, you know, every time I went to return stuff, you know, stuff that I didn't use or what I didn't use, I had to go return. I got a hard time from the people in Home Depot. I mean, for some reason, and I'm wondering, well, what what is the deal? And I mean, I would go and return. Things I haven't even, I didn't even touch. And I'm there returning it, and one girl calls the supervisor. And this is every time I went back, by the way, with different people, not the same, not even the same person. And, and this girl was there, and she calls her supervisor. And I said, oh, it wasn't used. And, and the girl said, well, you don't need to say anything. We're going to take care of this, and you don't want to hear. Keep your mouth shut up. And she's saying this, and I'm look, I look, because I was on my phone, I, nothing was used. And I'm like this, and she just goes off, and I look up. To look at her, and a, a little part of that little roll inside, you know, that little roll that said, rah! <laughs> you know, a little roll, I was going to say, what? You know, you know a little roll, I just rolled a little bit inside, and I'm looking at her, and, and she doesn't even look up. But I'm thankful that she didn't even look up. And it only but a, but a moment, but a moment, and I just, my dismay. <laughs> Miraculously, I didn't just, there was they didn't last too long, which is a miracle for me. And when I after I got the credit, I just walked off and I, I felt so peaceful. I never felt that way like this before. Because the roll will last a while. <laughs> the roll will be there for quite a while. Wanting and giving the look. I'm not sure look because my look was my look was just as bad as me speaking to that person. So I would have looked it down and said, you know, but I'm glad because the Lord was teaching me something. But I'm telling you that every time I went, same situation. One time they came and opened cans of tar, because I was going to use for the roof, that wasn't used. They opened the cans to make sure that I didn't bring it full of water. Oh my Tell me if that was, and there are times that God would, was challenging me in this area, and this was a, le a, le a le learning lesson for me because he was teaching me something. Truthfully, I've never felt more peaceful, ever. And I'm saying some something is wrong. I'm not comfortable. I'm not used to this, I was saying to myself. But I was like, wow, this is a different feeling. It feels awesome. I wasn't even phased after that, you know, and all the times that this was happening. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, every single time I went back, and I went back about four times to return stuff in the same situation with a supervisor. And usually these supervisors that I couldn't say, can I speak to your supervisor because I don't appreciate the way you, you're talking to me. It was the supervisors. <laughs> so I'm, I was at peace, and it worked out. But then here go God telling me, challenge me with areas where he's telling me, uh, see, he's now telling me, don't respond in these challenges. And then in other areas where I don't want conflict with individuals, he's telling me, I want you to go and deal with that. So what I want to deal with, he doesn't want me to say anything. And what I don't want to deal with, he's pushing me to say something. So here at this point, God knows exactly what we need. And so often we may not understand it all. You see, but God has a plan. Each of us has a vision of how Life ought to be, folks. Successful people don't spend a lot of time complaining about the way things ought to be. They face the facts that we live in an unfair, unjust world, and they deal with that reality. Ineffective people say that life is not fair. How many of you ever say life is not fair? And when we're saying that, it's because at this point, there's a part of us that doesn't really want to be responsible. Wow. Mm. We don't want to deal the reality. And here's, here's, here's the thing. 
which is another truth is, we need to stop repeating these failures. Right. We need to find new patterns. God wants to transform our lives. Tell me so. He wants to transform your life. If you're facing the same challenges at this point, if you're not changing, you have the same situations over and over again, what does that tell you? The definition of insanity is doing the same old thing and expecting what? Different results. If you don't change your patterns, you're going to repeat these things over and over and over again. But God has a plan. See? Proverbs 26.11. Who can tell me what Proverbs 26.11 says? Your app. You see how fast you can use your apps. Proverbs 26.11. Twenty six eleven, not the app. A dog returns <laughs> to his to his vomit, so fools repeat their folly. That's what it says. When we don't change, when we keep doing the same old thing, and like complaining and kicking and scratching is going to change anything. If you are facing a circumstance, it's because God's saying you need to deal with it. Turn to what you need to deal with. It. You need to deal with it. So ask yourself, what's unhelpful? What's the unhelpful patterns I am repeating in my life? And sometimes it's not even your fault. God puts you in positions. He put it four times when I was an old people. He faced the same situation. I'm saying, like, what is the deal? Because he has a plan and a purpose. If I tell you what it is, you'd be shocked because he's really, he was digging deep. But at this point, I wasn't even faced. Twenty six eleven. The fool repeats his folly. We don't want to be foolish, folks. We need to start looking at what God wants us to do is to be a witness, to be productive, to be victorious in every situation. If we're repeating, repeatedly disappointed by situations, always ending up the same, we have to take responsibility for our unproductive patterns. Now tell me, what's an unproductive pattern? What's an unproductive pattern? I'm going to make you think, I'm going to let you speak, because at this point I'm not going to tell you what it is unless and I'm, I'm you don't know. pattern is um, leaving home the same time every day and expecting to get to work on time. That's right. You leave late and you want to get to work on time. Yes. I love that analogy. Anything else? Not doing something because you don't feel like it. That's right. Complaining about your job. For complaining about your job. That's right. If there's something wrong in your job, you don't have to like your job, but you need to do it unto the Lord. You see? Big difference. Procrastination. You leave it to the last minute, expecting to, you know, not have problems. There are going to be consequences. God's putting us in a position to develop. And it's not pleasant. Peter's example of being in prison in chains, yeah, there was a purpose for that. Why did he let one get killed by the sword and the other one delivered? You find, well, how, why is that? You're questioning something because you really don't understand the principles. principles. God was doing something there in many levels. Who knows? Peter was saying, wow, he just killed him. I'm going to die? No. What did God do? He honored the people that were praying so that there was something that has to happen here. Right. Something negative has to only shows that something positive is in place. But I, I, I don't want to get into that, and I will deal and, and address that particular perspective so we know. But here we want to find out what are on uh, these patterns that we don't change. What are they? What are these patterns? We continue to do it. Ask yourself, what, a, what unhealthy patterns I'm repeating in my life? Because if you keep doing them, you're going to go the same consequences. And I'm willing to learn from them. I know. I love that. That is so true. Because every purpose and every experience and every circumstance is a lesson for us to learn. You may not like it. We can have, we can stand here today and I can feel one way, but I can still choose to do something else. And 
that's what we need to do. We can't get into what we feel, right? Here we go. You are not responsible for all the bad things that happen to you. But you are 100% responsible for how you respond to them. You got that one? What does that mean? I just want to make sure you know what that means. You can't prevent everything that comes into your life, but it's up to you to decide how to respond. To That's right. That is responsibility. It's just because someone spoke badly at me and cursed at me or, or did all this thing, doesn't mean I have the right to do it back. True power, true power is being, control, being in control of you. True power that no one, no matter what they do to you, can dictate your decision. Stories. I mean, if I, I mean, I would love to get into these these stories here because they're powerful. Here's the key to success: find a new pattern, and you will find opportunities to grow. So, what would be a new pattern to your circumstances? What would you say is a new pattern to the unhealthy patterns that you have now? Like I said, get up a little bit earlier so that you can get to work on time. Right. right. So often we think that an extreme, doing the total opposite, is the solution. But you know that the other extreme is just as destructive? Think about this a minute. Sometimes when we have habits, and we think that we're going to do totally hopping, we're finding another habit. We have to sort of understand that we need to conquer, let God conquer these particular areas in our lives. Because if we just do one thing to the other, it's almost like the Israelites came out of Egypt, right, and in the desert. If they would have came out of Egypt and gone straight to the promised land, what would have happened there? They would have been slain and killed there. No different. There's something that has to happen in between. This is why the desert experience was so vital. Not a pleasant place to be, not a good place to, to experience, not good because you don't get what you really want, but it was something that would help you to prepare for what was to come. We want the immediate because we don't want to be responsible. And God's saying it's time to change. Yes? Um, since this is tax season, a lot of us might be tempted that when we get our refunds to go buy a lot of stuff instead of complaining about all the Christmas bills that are still we're still dealing with and pay off our credit card debt. And so if you want to get out of debt, you might have an opportunity to get out of debt, but you're also tempted and you got all this little flush money to just go start buying up again. Yeah, that's usually, that's, that's usually the case. And that's why I love Diane's testimony when one day she'll put it all together and give it to you, but it was a powerful testimony. Whenever you have a responsibility, you have the opportunity to change. The choices, power, and a new outcome. If, now listen to the word, if, and if, this is the key. If you take responsibility for changing the patterns, what would happen? The outcome, the outcome will change. But if you continue to do the same old thing, and if you don't catch yourself, you're going to realize, and God will continue to make you face the same circumstances until you get it. This is why the Israelites never really changed their mentality, because they were stuck wanting what they wanted. That's all they knew. But I've worked with individuals that Taking them, they want to. They're convinced that this is the way it is. This is the way I am, and I finally come to a place that says, you just don't want responsibility. And she could give all the excuses in the world. You just don't want to take responsibility. And all these things in my life and this, you just don't want to take responsibility. And finally, before I even say it, oh, I know, I know, I just don't want to take responsibility. <laughs> now she starts to ask the question. What don't I want to take responsibility for? And that's a good question. What can you do about it? Well, you could probably do this. Try it. <clears throat> but you see, that's the first step. 
Now you know what to not do. Now there's another challenge. Well, how do I keep myself from not doing that? Starting. It starts little by little. Here's the next truth. Don't be diverted, distracted, or discouraged. Don't be diverted, distracted, or discouraged. Diversion means being distracted. Diversion gets our attention off of what we are responsible for. To make, to make the situation better, we will have to invest energy, work, we need to be responsible, folks. But it's going to take some investment. Have to make changes. It's easier to just uh, go on autopilot. Our nature, our nature is to be on over, over, um, autopilot. Let me just get quickly get this thing here, and so we, so we got to understand what's autopilot, pilot, folks. What is that? How does a autopilot work? Without thinking. It's just second nature. Just do it. You don't have to think about it. You're already, already, ah, uh, and you don't catch yourself. It's too late. A lot of this life is, uh, life is corrupt, folks. And we don't take control of, control of our choices. We will be permanently damaged by them if we don't take control. And a lot of us have already been damaged to the point where we think that that's the norm. When we don't make the changes and we continue to live a certain way, we think that's the norm. These individuals that we're working with, they already think that that's the norm. They've accepted the fact that they're not smart. Mind you that they have a degree, but they don't, they're not smart. They say, well, I just, for some reason, I just, I just learned this stuff. But they're still convinced that they're, they're not smart. This is why they keep making the same mistake. This is why they won't stand and be confident or take a chance. And they blame everyone else. Last scripture verse before we get to a close. 1 Peter 5, 7. Folks, we are not alone in our efforts to succeed. Amen. God wouldn't have, have not have made a promise to us if we couldn't fulfill it. He promised we would live a full and satisfying life. Not only in heaven, but here and now. He knows we can fix our problems, that we can't fix our problems by ourselves, though. So what do we have to do? We need to take responsibility. That means not placing ourselves in the same situation again and again. In the same destructive type of relationships again. Going on to the stores and shopping when you know you should have no, you have no money. Drinking when you know you can't handle it. Eat things that you know you better not to eat. If you keep getting the same, getting, getting those things done the same way, you're going to have the same results. You know why you repeated them and failed in these patterns. You know it. Emmanuel is the name for Jesus, and it means God with us. Turn to someone. God is with us. God is with us. He is the God of the miracles, just like he was a miracle for Peter in chains. Do you think that story was just a coincidence? God says, I will put you in situations just to show you. So what did it teach the people that were praying? When they saw him, they were shocked. Why would they be astonished and shocked? They were praying that God would do something, and here he comes. Whoa! No way. Why were they shocked? Because they weren't really trusting or believing. So we're just praying, Lord, but their prayer was effective. But they least expect it that quick. Expect it. Because I've been seeing God do things like this, like this. And it's been amazing. But we don't want to be responsible. We often worry about our position and status, hoping to get 
get the proper recognition uh, for what we do. But Peter advises us to remember that God's recognition counts more than human praise. God is able and willing to bless us according to His timing. We have to be humble. So we have to humbly obey God regardless of the present circumstance. And in His good time, either in this life or the next, He will lift us up. That's what He says. But there's lessons. Carrying your worries, stresses, and daily struggles by yourself shows that you do not trust God. How many of you trust God? And you need to put yourself in that position. Romans 8. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the Spirit, a Spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. You received the Spirit of what? The Spirit Himself testifies. See? Nothing and separate us from God's love. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can be against us? That is the promise he has given us. It's time for us to take responsibility, folks. To admit your need and to let others in God's family help you. Sometimes we think that uh, the struggles are caused by our own sin and foolishness, which they are, you see? And we think that is not God's concern. But when we turn to God in repentance, He will bear the weight, even of those struggles. Letting God have your anxieties calls for action. Are we ready to move forward? Let's bow our heads. Father, we know that you say in Romans that you're not going to hold back the gift of salvation.